I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel like I've missed the golden age of science. Back in the day, scientists could revolutionize our understanding of the universe with just simple equipment. Think of Galileo with his telescope, or Newton with his prism, Faraday with his magnets, Darwin with his bird watching, even Mendel with his flippin' peas. These days it feels like we've got these big things figured out, right? And even these massive teams with insanely expensive pieces of equipment are just refining the edges of our knowledge, ironing out smaller and smaller wrinkles. Well, here's the thing. Those scientists' discoveries span over 300 years. Through the magnifying lens of history, it's easy to lose your perspective. Science continues to evolve our understanding of the universe in really quite fundamental ways. I wanted to look back on the last three decades and look at what some of science's biggest discoveries have been. Here is how we understood the universe back in 1990. There are planets orbiting other stars. We didn't know that 30 years ago, at least not for sure. The first confirmed detection of an exoplanet was in 1992. A paper published in Nature in January that year looked at the variations in radio emissions from a pulsar and found that these were consistent with two or more planets orbiting that star. The astronomers used the Arecibo telescope in Puerto Rico, also known as GoldenEye, which is pretty flippant cool. Me from the future here, I filmed this before the telescope collapsed in December 2020. Here is the actual footage of that moment, which is heartbreaking to watch. Since then, scientists have confirmed the existence of over 4,000 other exoplanets, half of them using the Kepler Space Telescope, which launched in 2009. Leading up to 1990, scientists gathered more and more evidence that birds descended from dinosaurs. The prevailing theory at the time was that feathers probably arose in the kind of proto-birds that came after the dinosaurs. But then in 1996, we unearthed the fossil of a dinosaur that was not a direct bird ancestor, but it had feathers. This little floofball was called Sinosauropteryx, and it was unearthed in Liaoning province in China. The evidence of feathers was kind of unclear though, so it wasn't immediately accepted that this was a feathered dinosaur. But since then, scientists have found more and more fossils with even clearer evidence of feathers to back up this theory. This beautiful specimen is an actual dinosaur's tail preserved in amber. It was found in a market in Myanmar in 2015. So while the first Jurassic Park is excused from emitting the feathers, the later ones really should have known better. A bit of context. Back in the 1920s, Edwin Hubble built on work by Henrietta Swan Leavitt and Vesto Slipher to make two really incredible observations. First, he showed evidence for the existence of other galaxies beyond our Milky Way. This suddenly massively expanded our understanding of the size of the universe. Secondly, he showed that the universe itself is expanding. This completely upended the idea of a static, eternal universe, and was something that Einstein himself found hard to swallow. Flash forward 70 years. In 1998, another study completely revolutionized our understanding of the universe by showing that the expansion that Hubble measured is accelerating. The universe is getting bigger at an increasing rate. This doesn't quite square with our understanding that the universe is made up of matter, dark matter, and radiation, and so a fourth ingredient was added, dark energy. Dark energy had been theorized prior to 1998, but this study was its first direct evidence of its effect on the cosmos. In 1990, the periodic table looked like this. In the last 30 years, we've discovered nine new elements, the nine heaviest and the traditional Mendeleevian arrangement of the table. All of them were synthesized in physics labs. The last four, Nihodium, Moscovium, Tennessine, and Organesson, were all confirmed by a UPAC at the same time, in December 2015. But, as with Pokemon, if you think you've caught them all, you're probably wrong. This periodic table is an incredible tool for understanding the chemical elements, including ones not yet discovered. But it is just that, a tool. There's nothing in nature that prevents yet heavier elements from getting synthesized.
probably the biggest change in biology over the last 30 years is our ability to quickly and cheaply sequence genomes, as in to read the genetic code of an organism. This wouldn't have happened without the Human Genome Project, which was this massive collaborative effort that ran from 1990 to 2003. Scientists from around the world developed new techniques and tools and eventually fully sequenced the DNA from a small number of people. The result was a more complete understanding of the human body and how it works, and there were some surprising findings in there, like how few genes we actually have, uh, the fact that a lot of our genome doesn't really seem to do anything, and that some of that non-coding part of the DNA came from viruses that infected us and then left their DNA behind. Today, sequencing is fast and cheap, which allows scientists to do things like identify and study new viruses and develop new vaccines, which is pretty useful. The original project cost roughly 5 billion US dollars, but today a complete human sequence costs just a few hundred. Which is why today's video is brought to you by 23andMe, I'm just kidding. I'm not gonna lie, I don't understand quantum physics well enough to properly explain this one, but here's a short version. The standard model of physics is a theory that explains three of the four fundamental forces, the electromagnetic, weak nuclear, and strong nuclear forces, all except gravity. It also describes the universe as being made up of fundamental subatomic particles, quarks, leptons, and bosons. The model was developed over the last century, and since 1990, experiments have confirmed the existence of three of these fundamental particles. There was the top quark in 1995, the tau neutrino in 2000, and the Higgs boson in 2012. These experiments definitely supported the theory, but the last 30 years have also highlighted some of its shortcomings. Among other things, the standard model doesn't account for dark energy, and we also haven't observed an elementary particle for gravity, a so-called graviton, which may or may not exist. When I say human evolution, you might think of this picture. Or maybe a family tree with Homo sapiens at the top. These kind of paint the picture of Homo sapiens being the apex of human evolution, its lone and inevitable champion. But the last 30 years have given us more evidence that the picture is not so simple as this. Here are just a few of the findings. 2003, the remains of a new human species are discovered on the island of Flores in Indonesia. The species is nicknamed the Hobbit because the adults only stood about 1.1 meters tall, or 3 foot 7. April 2010, an article in Nature publishes the mitochondrial DNA genome from a finger bone discovered in the Denisova cave in Siberia in 2008. It's found to be a completely new human species, which we named the Denisovans, that lived at the same time as Homo sapiens. Just the next month, May 2010, a draft sequence of the Neanderthal genome is published, revealing that we interbred with this species and that their DNA is present in Eurasians today. December 2010, it's a busy year, the Denisovan genome is published, confirming that we interbred with this species too, and studies since have shown that we picked up a lot of useful adaptations from all of this interbreeding. For example, modern Tibetan people are better adapted to life at high altitudes due to a gene variant that they picked up from Denisovans which upregulates hemoglobin levels. These recent findings paint a picture of human evolution that's less like a tree and more like a braided river delta with streams twisting together and apart. The theory behind gravitational waves is not new. It was a prediction of Einstein's general theory of relativity, first published back in 1915. But unlike some of the other predictions, like gravitational lensing and time dilation, back in 1990 we'd never directly observed gravitational waves. Why is that? Well because by the time most waves reach here, their effect on us is minuscule. The space-time on Earth distorts by a fraction of the diameter of a proton. It took some flippin' impressive engineering to build and run the equipment to detect these. LIGO. These detectors in the US were first switched on in 2002, and they didn't detect much for eight years. They underwent some big upgrades for five years, and then in September 2015, almost immediately after being turned back on, they detected gravitational waves caused by the merger of two black holes. For the first time, we had evidence that gravitational waves are a real thing, not just some quirk of the maths. It's 
Speaking of directly observing a phenomenon predicted by the general theory of relativity, in 2019 the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration produced the very first ever image of a black hole. It took eight telescopes all around the world, each producing terabytes of data a day and two years of supercomputer analysis to produce this radio wave image of the black hole at the center of Messier 87, a galaxy 55 million light years away. So yeah, we're learning a lot all the time. Our picture of the universe looks quite different from what it did back in 1990. None of these discoveries we talked about were made by some lone genius tinkering away in their workshop. They were made by teams of people working together. And that's how science works, collaboratively. It may not be the picture that you get out of a history books, but I think it's the more beautiful one.